Good afternoon. This is very encouraging indeed. Um, I'm thrilled to be amongst so many people coming out on such a lovely day to talk about these issues and very impressed by the work of Farringdon Peace Group because it takes a lot of work to get this together. So thank you. I'm going to talk uh, in about 20 minutes um, about the following. How wars end, what kind of people end them, how are they using technology, how much does all this cost, and what are the waves of civil society activism that have happened over the last 50 years and end up with what can we do here now? So the good news about how wars end is that there's been a huge change since the early 1990s. And more wars, in fact, nearly twice as many wars, have ended through negotiated settlement than through military victory. In fact, 43 to 22 during the 1990s alone, and the curve is going up. The less good news is that 50% of those negotiated settlements, those carefully crafted peace agreements, fall apart within 10 years. So you have to ask yourself, why? And the research that we've done at Peace Direct and Oxford Research Group shows us that the main reason why uh, war breaks out again after a negotiated settlement is because ordinary people, people who've got a stake in the conflict, some of, the, some of them are people who want the war to go on because a lot of people make a lot of money out of war, haven't been brought into the peace process. They haven't been consulted, they haven't been engaged and found something that would be worth their while in the peace process after the violence had just begun to erupt. My friend Deka Ibrahim Abdi, who's a Muslim woman from northeastern Kenya, I'll just tell you a bit about her background because it, it will help you to understand the enormity of what happened. This woman was a school teacher and <clears throat> there'd been a long-standing feud between her clan and a neighboring clan, and 1,500 people had been killed. It was not mostly cattle raiding, but it was because the pasture land had dried up. And she went to the elders of her clan and said, can't we sort this out by our traditional methods? And they said, we're doing that, go away, you're just a woman, you don't understand. So she went to the woman of the other clan, and she said to them, we can't let this go on, too many of our young people are getting killed. And they sat down under a tree, and they put together the bones of an agreement, these two groups of women. And then they went along to the elders, and they sat with them, and they said, look, here's what we've got ready as the bare bones. Can you now make this happen? And they did, and the violence stopped. And that's how Decca began. She was then spotted by the president of Kenya, who asked her to set up training courses for people in different parts of Kenya. So she developed this big network. And then she was invited over to Woodbrook College in Birmingham to teach at the course there, a very fine Quaker course called Responding to Conflict. So she began to teach peace builders from all over the world. And then she went back to Kenya. She comes over almost every year. So when all this happened, she got a phone call from um, a general, General Opande, and he said, come immediately to Nairobi. Um, I'll send you a plane ticket. Get on the first plane, come here. So she walked into the Serena Hotel, which is about as posh as you can imagine. And there they had been given by the hotel a room, and these two retired generals, both of whom had done UN peacekeeping, um, a retired ambassador, and three members of the peace movement of Kenya, we're sitting. There was an empty chair. They said, sit in that chair, Decca. You're the chair, chairwoman, which she did. 
And what ensued is an absolute model of how ordinary citizens can stop violence. First of all, they had a network of 60,800 people who had cell phones. And what these people were doing was looking out of their windows and texting what was happening out of the window in their area. And they collated all that on um, flip charts and whiteboards, and they plotted all the hot spots of conflict and all the cold spots. And that was crucial because not only did they want to develop a strategy for the hot spots where things were getting really violent, but also for the places, the safe places, to which people would migrate if they needed to escape from a hot spot. Very, very clever. So they spent from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock every morning hearing all these incoming messages. People turned up screaming, yelling, cursing, furious, outraged, bereaved, and so forth. From 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, they developed strategy for the hot spots and the cold spots. And from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, they went out all over the country to organize evening rallies around peace slogans. They got hold of the media and got the media to stop publishing blood stories and hate stories and to begin publishing peace messages. They got hold of the churches, the women's groups, the community groups, the sports leaders, and the slum dweller leaders. And the result was that gradually, gradually, just by people power, they brought the violence down and down. And then Our job now, I think, is to support people who are laying their lives on the line rather than picking up a, an AK-47 and shooting their way out of it to support these incredible unsung heroes who are doing this in the different conflict areas all over the world. Um, there are other ways that they're... I'm just keeping my eye on the time. There are other ways that people are using technology. Some of you may have heard of uh, an organisation called Witness. What Witness does is to put uh, video cameras and phones with cameras into the hands of human rights activists uh, in all sorts of countries where human rights are being violated. For example, a woman in a full burqa in Afghanistan. You know that there are little, um, sort of almost like a grill over the face and sometimes over the pocket. And these women are filming abuse of women in the streets in Kabul and other areas and, and sending that film to the headquarters of witness. So there's a documentation going on that doesn't risk the lives of the human rights activists. These sums are shocking. Um, I did a, a, a mathematical calculation with the figures from the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development recently. Um, and to cut a long story short, the answer is this, that for every one dollar spent on prevention of conflict by those countries, $1,885 are spent on military approaches to conflict. Thank you, Silla. Um, I just wondered if you could make a comment on the use of social media and um, internet and technology, about whether you thought that this kind of new means and medium would help with peace and civil society, or, or whether it's just it doesn't make any difference. Uh, you mentioned the use of um, mobile phones, but there's so much uh, more access to information and ability to exchange ideas. Thank you very much for that um, prompt, as it were, because at Peace Direct we're really excited about new media. Um, I can't say we really understand how to do it yet, but we're getting people to help us. And, um, I mean, I can imagine incredible Twitter around these issues. We're also preparing a YouTube video about Decca Ibrahim Abdi that I told you about.